The next speaker would have been Dr. Macchetto, but we learned uh, very recently that he came down with the flu. And uh, so we are uh, greatly indebted to Dr. George Elu, who uh, within less than 24 hours noticed, stepped in, and is going to present uh, substantially to just talk. Thank you, George. Well, thank you. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I admit that uh, this is not a straight reading of some script uh, that Tuccio communicated to me. So think of this as a, the interpretation of a piece of jazz with a certain amount of freedom that you can take with this. I'm particularly pleased because my first job after graduate school was a postdoc, a one-year postdoc uh, at the Observatory of Arcetri. That's where I go back with uh, Alberto. And across from the observatory, every day you could look across this grove of olive trees to the cluster of homes and of houses over there, uh, in, which includes Il Gioiello, where uh, Galileo spent uh, the last 20 years of his life. So uh, this is, uh, and you know, every time I've gone back there, it's been a pleasure to sort of re reconnect with uh, with the uh, the spirit of the place and, and of the man. Um, so let me get on with the uh, with the talk. Um, I'll follow broadly speaking the uh, the design of the of the view graphs, but I'll have a couple of diversions. So the. I think I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time talking about the historical uh, aspects of uh, of the discovery of the invention of the telescope. There are certainly claims that uh, Galileo found out about such a device and then turned it to the sky. This is uh, his uh, first sketch of what it would look like. Some people have claimed it was uh, on purpose rather vague. Uh, but this is often how we still do our projects. We start out with very vague sketches, very optimistic that uh, sort of uh, convey the, the, the basic idea. And then when it's time to actually get uh, things funded, you, you, you run into the real cost of doing things. Uh, so as you can see in this, uh, uh, this is, these are, I guess, the uh, two of the uh, examples of the actual telescopes as they were built. Uh, this is a young Galileo, still described as a mathematician. This plot tries to capture the progress of the, of the telescope and the power of the observing tools that we have at our disposal since the day of Galileo. And uh, this axis is supposed to capture some kind of sensitivity improvement over the eye. Uh, the, the, the simple point here is that uh, over uh, three centuries, most of the advance came from using a larger collecting area to collect the light, concentrate it, and put it into the eye of the observer. Galileo made a big jump when he went from just using the, basically the area of his iris to using the area at, uh, that, that is the, the front end of the telescope. Uh, and, then, and then people slowly increased, improved on that. And as you can see, this goes on into the first part of the 20th century with the Mount Wilson Observatory. However, at somewhere early in the 20th century, we invented this thing called photography, where we had now a better way to utilize the photons collected by the telescope, and that gave us this increase. So the red curve is the collecting area, and then this in improvement in the, in the power of the instrument comes from having better detectors. And then the CCDs came in sometime in the 70s and 80s, and that was another uh, huge boost. And, and this saga of better instrumentation to, to use the... Uh, um, um, light falling into the telescope uh, ha continues to this day. Uh, then we go into space, and all of a sudden there's a big jump, even though HST itself, the Hubble Space Telescope, is only a two and a half meter telescope. The reason for this great improvement is that the atmosphere is out of the way, and the atmosphere, which makes the, the stars twinkle, in fact, makes the images broader than they need to be, and so when you sharpen the images again, you get the advantage, uh, and you can detect more uh, accurately. And that's where we get these beautiful uh, pictures from. Um, and then looking out to the horizon, there's the James Webb Space Telescope, which I'll say a couple words about later. However, going into space did something much more important in a sense for us, which is that it opened up the whole um, of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, to, to scrutiny. Um, and 
we went from having a hardly an octave, which is what the visible light represents, to having you know ten octaves on the red side and another twenty octaves on the on the blue side of light. And I'll, uh, the next few slides um, talk a little bit about what we learned from these other wavelengths. And uh, this is uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope is, uh, has been in operation since ninety three uh, since two thousand and three. Uh, it is an infrared telescope. It's, it, it functions at wavelengths from 3 to 200 microns, roughly. And uh, what it can do is detect the infrared emission, whereas, uh, which, as you can see in this comparison between the infrared light and the visible light, picks out the dust in the interstellar medium. It picks out where stars are formed. And um, it, it gives a very different picture of the, of the universe. Uh, this is an image of the uh, large Magellanic cloud. Here's an image of comets. And the, one of the, the, the main drivers to going into the infrared is that we, we knew even before uh, Spitzer launched, but we now understand it even better, that if you look over the history of the, of the universe, uh, the history of cosmic star formation, half of that history is in fact encoded in the infrared. And you would miss it completely if you limited yourself to observing in the visible. And, that, and if you want to have the full picture, that you have to go there. The most recent addition to this table of uh, observatories that, that go longwards of, our, of the visible light is uh, the Herschel uh, submillimeter observatory, which just launched in May, uh, along with Planck, about which you'll hear more later, and is already returning some spectacular images. The, wh what it's telling us is that in the areas where stars are forming, you can start now seeing the very cold material, which is designated in red here, out of which you will form the, the, star, the, the cores and the stars. So if you look at something like this, this shows you how you progress from very diffuse, very cold material, like the, the, the material that in the local ISM that uh, uh, Professor Parker was just describing, into things which are more dense and very cold. And then along those strings, now for, for the first time, we can see that transition from the very, very cold material in these strings to the cores where stars are being formed. Um, here's another uh, look into, um, into the infrared. This one is a much smaller telescope. The um, Herschel was a three and a half meter telescope. This, the mirror is three and a half meters across. Uh, this telescope is only 40 centimeters across. Uh, but it, it will, this, unlike Herschel or Spitzer, will map the whole sky. It's called WISE, the infrared survey, the wide field infrared survey explorer. It's scheduled to launch in uh, December. Uh, a couple of weeks from now, uh, and it will uh, give us yet another view of the sky. Oh, here's the rocket getting ready for, for the launch. Now, if I go to the blue side of the visible light, which is the X-ray uh, uh, universe revealed by these X-ray observatories, here again, uh, you cannot do any X-ray astronomy from the ground, and you need to go to, to space. The, 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 the preeminent uh, observatories today are Chandra, which is another... Uh, NASA Great Observatory, so to speak, and, and this is the European uh, 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 equivalent to it. And what you learn from going to the X-rays is you, you learn about the very energetic phenomena that produce uh, very hot plasma, which you detect in the X-rays. So here's an example of two um, clusters colliding. Uh, the, the very the magenta-colored uh, material here is the very hot plasma, which is coming... Uh, which is presumed to be the result of uh, the, the intergalactic medium, the gas contained in each of the two clusters coming together in a, in a very energetic shock and being heated to these temperatures. This blue material, which is the um, dark matter, I will talk about later. Um, another thing which you can pick up in the, in the X-rays are these very energetic jets which come out of uh, black holes. So uh, X-rays give us the best way to look into the the, the centers of galaxies where black holes are forming and where they and accreting material and getting more massive, but at the same time emitting large amount of energies. Black holes that are accreting material are the, are the brightest continuous shining things in the in the universe. Whereas on the other hand, in the gamma rays, yet more energetic particles, we find the most intense and the most luminous uh, objects that are of short duration. These things called gamma ray bursts. Gamma ray bursts were uh, discovered uh, in the 80s um, and have been studied and for, for a long time. We had no idea whether they were 
nearby objects in the Milky Way that were of modest uh, luminosity or where they were distant and very luminous objects, and now we know that they are the most luminous outbursts. They're much brighter than supernovae. And uh, the way we find that out is we localize them and then we look uh, around and we find that they correspond to galaxies. So now back to the Hubble Space Telescope, which is, which is one of the more um, uh, recognizable icons of, uh, of space uh, astrophysics. And this, is, this is the observatory before it was launched. It's a pretty large observatory, as you can see, and it has been uh, serviced several times now. Here's a picture from the most recent servicing mission in May of 2009. And this goes back to what I said earlier, that this progress of putting better instrumentation in, in the focal planes of telescopes where you collect uh, light is really, I mean, that's what keeps these telescopes interesting for a long time. Here's an interesting picture which shows a model of uh, Galileo's telescope that had been carried along with on the shuttle and looking out of the window is the actual <laughs> Hubble Space Telescope there. Um, so this is a list of the, sort of the, the, the top 10 um, results from the uh, Hubble mission so far. Uh, the distance scale of the universe, there was a, a very accurate measurement of this, of the, uh, uh, basically the size of the universe. Uh, giant black holes in galaxies, beautiful measurements showing that the, the gravitation is so intense that the only way to explain uh, the, what you observe is the, is the existence of black holes, which are very massive and very uh, dense uh, emission lines in active galaxies telling us about the role of these black holes in, in heating the galaxy, the galactic gas and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and making it um, and sort of interaction of, of the, of the uh, energy flow from the black hole with the, with the galaxy and, and, and its structure. Uh, the intergalactic medium, uh, this is uh, by looking at very distant quasars we can see uh, the intervening material which is absorbing the light from the quasar and that gives us a map of the, uh, of the universe. It's a, in a way, it's like taking an X-ray of an object. Um, interstellar medium chemistry, formation of galaxies. So these are all very... Uh, the, each one of these uh, topics can launch a talk by itself and I won't go into great detail into that. So this is a... So the question is, what do we do with all of these telescopes? Well, this... I'm going to try and sort of summarize one way of thinking about sort of one of the major pursuits in, in, in astronomy. And here's sort of a, a rogues gallery of telescopes. I've talked about this. This is Hubble. This is JWST, which is the, the successor. Uh, these two are um, uh, cosmic microwave background mapping uh, missions about which you'll hear more. There's Spitzer. Here are the two Keck telescopes. So here are some ground-based major optical observatories. Here's a radio observatory and here's a future planned radio observatory. Uh, these are, even though they are individual antennae, they are linked together to form a single observatory. Um, so the, these um, satellites that, that map the cosmic microwave background, about which you'll hear more from Paolo later on today, uh, reveal a, 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 a very detailed image of what the primordial fireball looked like at the moment where, uh, where um, uh, matter and radiation decoupled. And, and we're about to launch a... In fact, th this was... So the, the cosmic microwave background was first revealed by Kobe in, in, in great with, with a beautiful result which earned the Nobel Prize not too long ago. WMAP has, been, has followed that on and Planck is now was launched at the same time as, uh, as Herschel and is uh, in the process of, of giving, getting us an even better image of that. This is an interesting picture because it shows, see this is where the light comes in, so you're looking now this way at the, at the, at the satellite, so you see there's the mirror, and then there's another mirror here, and then here's the focal plane. What's, what's more interesting is that you can see a reflection of the Herschel telescope in the mirror, since they were launched together at the same time, this, was a, this is a unique picture where you can see two major observatories sitting in the same, um, in the same uh, uh, clean room. So the question is, how did we go from this beautiful, well-described fireball to the, the universe as we see it today? So that's, that's a simple way to summarize one of the major pursuits of, um, of astronomy. And just as, as I said, we can, can describe in great detail what the fireball looked like. 
We also can describe in great detail what the local universe looks like, and it's very complicated. Um, we have some inklings about the fact that gravity is at work, so we have had to go through a period of time during, during which gas collapsed and formed galaxies. We know that mergers are very important uh, as part of the evolution of galaxies. We know that interactions, even if they don't result in mergers, can generate a lot of, uh, of, the, of the power that we see emitted from these galaxies. And then we end up with what we see today, which is these very nicely organized galaxies and everything inside of them all the way down to these uh, to the to, uh, stars that have planets around them and so on. This image, by the way, was obtained with the Galileo spacecraft. Um, so the question is, how do we get from there to here? And uh, people have spent a lot of time studying each of the steps and, and there is a period of time where we have very little information, which is called the Dark Ages. We know a lot about this part, and we, we're constantly making uh, insight, getting insights into some of, some of the other uh, uh, epochs. Um, and as we try to assemble this picture, we run into these other things that we have to study, such that, that are important, to, some of which are processes that fall directly into the, uh, the progress from the early universe to today's universe, and some of which are mysterious things that just make it a little bit harder to understand, things like dark matter and dark energy. So concerning processes, the, um, the kinds of things that uh, happen when you have uh, galaxies interacting is that you get um, star formation, goes through periods of quiescence and periods of explosive uh, starbursts, and we don't quite understand what makes it do this or that. Uh, then when you do have these explosive uh, episodes of star formation, there's a lot of uh, winds that flow back out in the intergalactic medium. The galaxy itself is disrupted if the AGN, if the, if the quasar is very powerful. And we don't quite know how, how all of these mechanisms work. So, um, and then there's this thing called dark matter. I'll spend a few slides on dark matter and then move on to, uh, to, the, to, to other topics. So dark matter is basically a component of the universe which that we of, of which existence we know primarily because of its gravitational effect on uh, on observables and so in a galaxy like this one we can count up the stars never mind the fact that there's a lot of dust here we, we work our way around that so we count up how many stars there are we count up how much mass we should ex we expect and then we expect the velocity curve to look something like this like line a uh, then we go out and observe it and we find that it runs more like B. And the only way that can, this can be happening is either we don't understand the laws of gravity, which is very unlikely, or um, that there is material here which adds to the gravitational mass but cannot be seen. And that's what, and in, in, when I was a graduate student, it was called missing mass, now it's called dark matter. And uh, that's kind of the, one of the essential um, proofs for its existence. Uh, this is an illustration of the fact that if you have uh, gravitational mass, it will also bend light, and therefore you expect if, if the object is at B, well, I'm sorry, if the object is at A, and it, its light gets curved, and you're observing it from here, you'd think it was at B, and that effect can, if you line things up just right, you can form not just points which are displaced, but, but rings. In fact, we do observe that effect. These beautiful rings you see here are all images of galaxies which are sitting behind this cluster of galaxies, which are distorted by the gravitational, what we call gravitational lensing of these clusters. Um, and from this, we can actually weigh that cluster. We can figure out how much it, uh, it weighs. And this is a, an effect seen in many places, and that's how we can estimate the mass of these clusters. There are other ways to estimate the mass, and they all agree, which gives us an assurance that this dark matter must really exist in some form. This is a, a recent piece of work which demonstrates that it's not just weighing individual clusters, but you can actually map out the distribution of this dark matter in, uh, uh, over quite a distant, quite a, uh, a distance uh, in the sky. Um, the other striking uh, thing that we stumbled on as part of studying the, the evolution of the universe is this, uh, what, what is called the, the uh, dark energy, and that was because we were studying the expansion velocity. This was started by Edwin Hubble back in, uh, in the early 20th century using Mount Wilson. This was one of the major discoveries of this telescope. 
I think you heard about that earlier today. Um, he discovered uh, cosmic expansion, and, and since then we have trying to, be, to measure it more and more accurately. And so uh, one of these methods is to use supernovae. I won't go into details. Supernovae are things that go off, and this is before, and this is during the supernova explosion, and then it goes away. And so you can measure the brightness of this source, and see, this one is above the picture. So you then um, measure the, the brightness, and you can estimate the distance. You measure the, the speed, and from that you, you, you measure uh, how fast the universe is expanding. And to make a long story short, what we discovered is that it wasn't that the universe was going to collapse back into itself. It wasn't that it was going to expand forever. We discovered something very peculiar, which was that it first was expanding and with a, with a, uh, at a slow rate, and then all of a sudden it has started accelerating some time ago. And this is the, and the, to explain that, um, we, people introduced this notion of dark energy. Um, and uh, as of now, we really have very little information of, about it, and we need more telescopes to understand it better. <laughs> uh, so this is a, 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 in, in, in this ever-evolving picture of the universe is an interesting step, because out of this, what we learn is that dark energy is actually the predominant constituent of the universe, and then cold matter called dark matter is another quarter. And then here we have everything that we see, all of the stars we see, all of the planets, all of the people around us constitute only 4%. And the point is that not only are we not at the center of the universe, we're even a, a we're, we're just a detail. <laughs> um, getting back to uh, telescopes, the notion of telescope evolved, has evolved quite dramatically. And so today, for instance, as I mentioned earlier, we can link together a bunch of different individual uh, telescopes like this, in the radio in particular, and in essence use the whole continent as a telescope because when you link them together and you and you, this is what's called a very long baseline, baseline array, uh, you essentially use the, the whole of this collection as one telescope. It's almost as though you had a single telescope with this size. Um, other uh, entities that are used as telescopes, these are not telescopes used in the traditional sense. These are light collectors which look uh, at radiation generated in the atmosphere as gamma rays hit the atmosphere and with channel conf radiation th that is picked up by these telescopes, you can then learn about that gamma ray. So in essence, you're using the atmosphere now as part of your telescope. And here's another experiment which is looking for neutrinos. And what they've done is they have instrumented the ice in Antarctica. And they, are, they have light detectors looking down because what they really want is to have the neutrinos come through the Earth, generate, again, interact with, the, with, uh, with Earth and with the ice and generate radiation, which they want to pick up. And it's, uh, say it's, it's one kilometer across and it's one kilometer under the ice. Uh, this is a listing of the top problems. I, in, a, in a sense, you, you solve the problems and then new ones are posed by what you think are your answers. Um, this is an indication that, that there's always a, a next step in, in, uh, in astronomical telescopes. Uh, this is the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and here are a couple of concepts. In fact, those have been merged now into this uh, concept called the International X-ray Observatory. Um, Hubble, JWS, the, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is uh, scheduled for launch sometime after 2014, um, is, in a way is the, uh, um, uh, is the heir of both the Hubble Space Telescope and Spitzer because it operates at wavelengths from about 1 micron to 28 microns. So it's really an infrared uh, satellite, but it has the, a very large area and, uh, and this, the, the, the accuracy with which it can image the sky is comparable to the, space, uh, to the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. And you heard about Herschel, which is already in orbit. It's not part of the future anymore. And why is it about to launch? And this is a, a concept of a uh, uh, Japanese-led mission with a, the same mirror that we have on Herschel, except that it's going to be cooled to around 5K. Uh, so let me close with a couple of slides. One of the things that has uh, always struck me about Galileo is that he, he was ahead of his time in many ways. And one of the things that, all, that comes to mind is that what he did is something that, that our best uh, 
scientists today aspire to, which is he, he realized that there is a, tech, a new technology sitting out there waiting to be adapted or adopted for uh, astronomy, and he did that. He did that very successfully. But not only that, but he did the research, and he recognized the importance of what he'd found, and he rushed out and published it quickly. <laughs> uh, the, the, if you, if you uh, look at the Sidereus Nuncius, you can, you, you, it's, uh, it was published within a year of when he made his first observation. It's quite remarkable. And this is the uh, last slide that uh, which you put together, which, which is a quote. And this is now in, in, a, in a sort of Florentine vernacular. <laughs> it's, uh, it's about it's a it's a uh, it's a warning not to um, not to get too enamored of our own theories and think that we understand the universe better than uh, and and listen to what it has to tell us. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there is time for a quick question. Please, George. Um, I was wondering one of your very early slides uh, comparing Galileo's telescope all the way up to Hubble and their efficiency of gathering optical energy. Um, there was a band on the right hand side behind the Hubble Space Telescope. That's uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Oh, you're absolutely right. That should be on this this slide. I I, I should have mentioned it too. When so um, so when I guess uh, 15 years or so ago, when we started figuring out how to do that on the ground, how to to tighten the images of stars on this, we in fact jumped up by a factor of anywhere from 10 to however much you think you're doing. So, uh, I guess one I guess one could. Yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. That's a, that's a very good point. Thank you, George, again. Thank you.